Welcome back to another nano video. Today we're going to be looking at the RTX 3060, specifically the Galax RTX 3060 One Click OC model, which is one of the more budget oriented RTX 3060s that's going to be on the market, targeting somewhere around that $329 MSRP. Now, sadly, right now, I just don't have anything to compare this to just yet due to how short of a supply the RTX 3060 uh, series cards really are. And really any 30 series card is just out of stock. So I don't really have anything to compare it to. However, I've got a Galax One Click OC RTX 3060 Ti, which I can get loaned from a friend. So I'm waiting on that and I'll soon do a comparison between the two cards. Now, just a quick disclaimer about the benchmarks that are ahead. I've pushed every game to its absolute maximum with every graphics feature, and I've set that basically just to the highest available option. I did this mainly just to ensure that I stress the GPU as much as possible and also to reduce any sort of CPU bottleneck. So if you're seeing lower FPS or results compared to other reviews in games like GTA 5 or Red Dead Redemption 2, it's because I've enabled the advanced options and cranked them all the way up as well as the anti-aliasing. However, no resolution scale was applied, so whatever resolution you're seeing is actually the true resolution. Now, in addition, I only tested 1080p and 1440p as this really isn't a 4K gaming card and you'll see why from the results in a second. Now, with that out of the way, let's just look at the first set of benchmarks. Here we have the Division 2, Rainbow Six Siege, and Red Dead Redemption 2, which are all perfectly playable at 1080p around or above that 60 FPS mark while fully maxed out. Now, once we move to 1440p, all but Rainbow Six Siege dip into the low 50s. Now, while I call that playable, I'd recommend that you stick to 1080p if you want to fully maximize every setting in these games. However, if you stick to maybe a mix of high and ultra settings, you can likely get away with an extra 10 or so FPS at 1440p. And so you'll be way above that 60 FPS target, especially when you're playing more strenuous games like Red Dead Redemption 2. Next, let's move on to Hitman 3 and GTA 5. We can see that Hitman 3 enables almost a high refresh rate experience out of the RTX 3060, which isn't so surprising, especially with how the game is sort of set out. It's got rather simple levels and more confined spaces, which enables higher frame rates than the open world of Grand Theft Auto 5. But Grand Theft Auto 5 is also perfectly playable at 1440p, especially if you were to minimize the anti-aliasing and advanced options that we had enabled. These options seem to hit really any system quite hard and something more like four times or two times MSAA is more than adequate to play GTA 5 with. And that's in comparison to the eight times MSAA that we had enabled. You can also reduce maybe the grass and the shadow quality since those aren't as important in an open world game. Regardless, overall, I think if you buy this as a 1080p card upgrade, from say something like a GTX 1060, then you're in for a pretty good card that'll target somewhere between 60 and 80 FPS in most modern strenuous games and anything more esports related like Rainbow Six Siege or CSGO, you're gonna find that you're gonna be able to reach those higher refresh rates more consistently and at a higher frame rate than you were in any previous generation card. Moving on to synthetics, we can see scores in the 8,700 range for Time Spy, 10,000 in Fire Strike Extreme, and in the 5,000s for Fire Strike Ultra and Port Royal. As a reference, a 2060 Super reaches very similar numbers in these tests, and when I mean very similar, I mean even down to like the tens. Essentially, that's what you're gonna get in most games is between 2060 Super and 1080 Ti performance. It'll be more towards the 2060 Super though, which isn't so bad for gaming at 1080p, even at 1440p, especially for esports games. I just think though, if you're sitting on something like a 2060 or even a 1660 Super, this just really isn't a worthwhile upgrade for you as a gamer, especially if prices are inflated at your local retailers because of low stock. 
Now, as for temperatures, my Galaxy 3060 one-click OC card reached around about 74 degrees Celsius as an average across all of these tests. And that was while it was in my NZXT S340 case. So the GPU will be decently cooled by the two fans and the heatsink provided. With regard to the actual design of the card itself, you know, it's really a subjective thing. It features a plastic faceplate with a black carbon fiber imitation look. I think it'll work in most budget builds just fine. You know, black rarely clashes with really any other color in your case. And there's no fancy RGB lights here. So if you want anything like that, you're gonna have to move up to the Galax EX model of this card, or you're gonna have to look maybe at another AIB option. But overall, I quite like the card's aesthetic. It understands it's a budget card, and I think the look is quite tasteful for what it is. It does also include a backplate, which is okay and does the job of a backplate, but it doesn't really add anything special to the card. And most cards do come with a backplate these days, so I really wouldn't worry about that as a feature or selling point. But it does give some rigidity to the card and also protect it, possibly if you ever have a leak in your system from like an AIO cooler or something like that. But in summary, the card really isn't ugly. It just doesn't have anything to make it really stand out or feel like it's anything above the budget that it's targeting. But sometimes that can be an advantage, especially if you're sick of having, you know, RGB all over your computer, or maybe you just want that clean blackout look, or maybe you're just targeting a more budget oriented system. Either way, I think this will work just fine. If not amazingly, if that's sort of the look that you're trying to get is that blackout look. Otherwise it's going to be just fine. It's nothing amazing, but doesn't really scream like terrible to me either. Lastly is the power limit and overclocking. I'm just gonna get this straight out of the way. You're not gonna get any sort of massive overclock out of this card as the power limit slider is stuck at 100%. So whatever you get out of the card is what you're gonna get. You can still increase the core clock. You can also do some undervolting and these can increase your performance in MSI Afterburner or some other similar application. And from that, I was able to get my card to boost around about 1950 to 1980 megahertz. Nothing amazing, but not bad. Definitely an increase over the 1800 megahertz that the card was boosting to normally. Considering this basically increased performance by a frame or two at most in games, and that's usually within variance, I just didn't really test anything to do with overclocking on this card. It doesn't really warrant it for the sort of performance increase that you're gonna get. And uh, considering this card isn't a big overclocker, it's not really worth my time. It's more really of a silicon lottery thing with the overclock that you can get out of this card. Now the card is being power limited and I do think that is a bit of a bummer, but with higher end 30 series cards, like say a, a Strix 3080 or a Strix 3090, Rarely does an overclock really get you more than a 5% performance increase anyway, so I wouldn't be too worried about missing out on something like the power limit slider giving you an increase because, as I said, it just doesn't really give you a performance increase anyway, and when you do get it, you're better off doing something like an undervolt because most of these cards are already pushed sort of to the limit by the GPU boost algorithm anyway. So if you can actually bring down the temperatures, you can boost a little bit more out of the card for a more consistent sort of performance target and you will also decrease temperatures because you're using less voltage and you're also just having less power moving through the card in general. All in all, I think this is a decent budget card that will likely have decent availability. It all really comes down to the price and the availability of these cards and that's really what's going to influence your purchasing decision, I think, in the current climate. So if you can find one of these in stock and it's at MSRP and you just want a budget upgrade from say a GTX 970 or a GTX 1060, then I say go for it. It'll be a decent upgrade if you can find it and in stock and at that MSRP. Also, the 12 gigabytes of VRAM is more than enough to play any modern games and it'll also really give you sort of a good baseline well into the future. So that's a bit of a bonus. However, the, if these are like overpriced due to lack of stock and this card specifically, 
I would try and shop around for maybe a better AIB model as the main advantage of this card really is the budget price. And if you're gonna be paying more than MSRP, you might as well be getting something extra or more out of the card. Maybe like RGB lights, if that's your thing, or a higher power limit, or maybe even just more cooling potential out of getting you know, a thicker heat sink or an extra fan. But yeah, overall, not too bad. I think the card's great, so go for it if you find it for $329. But if you find it for anything more than that, don't go for it. So thanks for watching, I guess. If you have any comments, leave them down below. I'll be sure to answer them. If you enjoyed the review, hit the like button. Uh, lastly, I'll also be testing other features like DLSS and ray tracing in some upcoming videos, as well as, like I said at the beginning of the video, I'll be comparing this to a 3060 Ti version of this same card. So subscribe to the channel to see those. And uh, yeah, I'll just catch you guys in the next video.